Hello everyone, welcome to the latest edition of the Front Page, the Racing Post news and discussion programme. The Grand National, the Whip, the Prime Minister and the affordability checks all to be discussed in this programme today. We hope, as usual, you will like, comment, share and subscribe. That would delight not just myself, but also the two lovely people sat next to me. The Specialist Writer of the Year, Jonathan Harding, and broadcaster and journalist extraordinaire, Maddie Plale. I'm Lee Mottis, I don't just make a half-decent Yorkshire pudding. Um, Jonathan, <laughs> what have you done since you last appeared on this programme? So I've been on holiday trying to learn how to ski with mixed results. Okay. Mixed in what way? Mixed in the sense I can now ski mm -hmm. competently, that's, one might say. That's impressive. But I, it took a lot of falling to get to that point. What slopes were you going down? I very slowly navigated a black, which felt like a win, until a six-year-old Swiss boy went past me <laughs> twice as fast. But on the black ones are really, really steep ones. Depends. Yeah, they're the steeper ones, but they, they range from okay to stupid. And Goodness. I was on the okay ones. I'm hugely impressed. I can't even ice skate. I tried ice skating once and I kept falling over. And I saw I, I, I abandoned that. Um, Maddie, have you been skiing? Uh, not recently as Jonathan, but yeah, I've been skiing. Yeah. I, I can I can just about manage. But no, since the last time on this show, I've been walking at a much slower pace, I'm sure. I'm um, glad to report. Didn't fall over, although nearly did a couple of times. Yeah. So I guess myself and Jonathan are sharing that. But yeah, in good form, Lee. Thanks. Yeah, I would definitely be a walker. Uh, not a skier for, for safety and um, personal health reasons. Um, before we get going, I would like to advise you to uh, take heed of the recommendation in this plug for the Racing Post Members Club. Okay, time then for story one. We are going to look at the world's greatest horse race, the Randox Grand National, Maddie Player. Let's over to you. Yes, so what I'm going to do now is reel off um, a load of stats from Tuesday's weight launch. Uh, in case you've missed it, you've been living under a rock, here is your update. So 77 horses remain in the 2023 Grand National. We learned uh, last week that the 2021 winner, Manila Times, has been retired. As it stands, Velvet Elvis is, in theory, the 40th uh, in line, so he's guaranteed a slot in the race. Uh, Gordon Elliott has 21 entries. Chemical Energy and Manella Kroona are not qualified of his, meaning he has eight in the top 40. And Willie Mullins has eight entries, and with Captain Kangaroo, recite a prayer unlikely to get in. Mr Incredible, who you remember finishing uh, yeah. second in the Classic Chases, 51st on the list. The most fancied of his lot is Capodanu. Uh, who will carry 11 stone five. He's got five in the top 40. The top six in the weights are all Irish trained. 29 of the top 40, if you include Manila Times, or 30 of the top 41 are Irish trained. Um, and there was an overall 20% uh, decrease in entries. So 107 in 2022 and just 85 this year, which I think reflects... Um, the, the race has changed and it's a classier race now. It's not a race you can put a 130 rated staying handicap chaser in. Um, and in the last couple of years, we've seen the Irish dominance. They've had the top three in the race and uh, showed their hand much more than that uh, since 2017 when one for Arthur won. Um, and it's funny, obviously, we've heard a lot from Martin Greenwood and how the Brits are struggling. Dan Skelton came out and... and yeah. Um, took a, a bit of offence at those at those comments, and I think this is just emblematic of, of Ireland's strength in depth at the moment. To be honest, and I think trainers are being shrewd with their entries. They know that it's not going to be wise to fork out all that money uh, if their horse just isn't going to get in. And of course, we've also had the um, the sort of touch point, I guess, if you like, of qualification. Our power, who won on Saturday, is 62nd on the list for Sam Thomas, who you'll know had I Will Do It. Uh, he isn't qualified to run in the race. And Jamie Snowden's currently facing um, a bit of an uphill task to get Gar Law, um, who won the Paddy Power Gold Cup, qualified as well. 
So uh, Ted Walsh, unhappy with any second now's top weight. Uh, in contrast, Emmett Mullins, he was fine with Noble Yates going up £19 after last year's win. Of course, that horse is going to be targeted at the Grand National. But several others happy as well. Lutinda Russell with Correct Rambler and uh, Tom Gibney also happy with Velvet Elvis's um, allotted weight. So hopefully that's about caught you up. Yeah, um, excellent, Pracy. Um, I suppose the, the 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 big news angle with, with regards this year's Grand National is that point that you referenced there regarding um, the lack of British entries and almost certainly a lack of of British runners. Um, Martin Greenwood, as you said, Maddie, he spoke about how he thought it was a reflection um, on the current state of British jump racing. He didn't um, he didn't really backtrack on that at the National Weights Lunch on Tuesday. He, he ran through some of those stats that you went through. He said it's very disappointing um, that the UK will likely have a quarter of the Grand National field. Um, Jonathan, how, two questions. How much does that take away from the interest in the race, the fact that it will be dominated by uh, not the home country, if you like, that 30 of the four trainers could be trained in Ireland, many of them by two trainers, Willie Mullins and Gordon Elliott. And um, how significant is it as well? Is it a one-off blip, do you think, or does it just form part of this wider trend? Well, I think in answer to your first question, I, I don't think it will detract from the interest all that much, only in the sense that this sort of consolidation of power in so few hands means it's slightly less competitive as a, as a betting heat. And I, I think you like to see it's that race that kind of allows those small yards and people with a certain type of horse to perhaps punch above their weight in a way that they can't at Cheltenham Festival. Yeah. And it requires a sort of certain type of horse. And I just think if you have Mullins and Elliott in particular having so many in the field, it's it's a case of, well, which one of theirs is going to win as opposed to which one of the 40? You know, I've always thought, wouldn't it be novel to have a limit to how many horses each uh, not necessarily trainer, but each owner can have, you know, yeah. we don't want to have five or six representing one set of connections. In terms of the, the broader significance, these things are often cyclical. We have a situation where the Irish trainers have the stronger talent pool and they certainly have more strength and depth in this very particular type of horse, those staying chasers. And I think there might be an argument to say they've just caught on a little bit faster to the adjustments to the race. They're throwing novices at it they're trying to look for those younger horses that perhaps they have a plethora of whereas the british trainers perhaps don't i don't it's one of those you can it, it is a symptom of a, a larger problem i don't know if it's specific to the grand national so much as ireland are just on top at the minute will that be permanent only time will tell but I, these things tend to be cyclical yeah i, I, w I wonder if sometimes we um, when we're talking about ireland and britain um we we make it into a slightly different um, problem than, than than it is, if problem's the right word. It's not necessarily Ireland, it's two trainers in Ireland. It's Willie Mullins and Gordon mm -hmm. Elliott who have become hugely, um, not just successful, but dominant. Henry de Bromhead to a lesser degree. And you see that as well in the in the Cheltenham Festival markets. Look at the, the, the Triumph Hurdle, I was at Kempton on, on Saturday after scriptwriter got beat. Um, to the spot with Milton Harris, had a grand each way on before the race for the Triumph Hurdle. There are no British trained contenders for Triumph Hurdle now available to back at less than 40 to 1. Bo Zenith won the race according to Gary Moore, he was in at 16. So nothing in Britain at 40 to 1 or less for the Triumph Hurdle. Other races aren't quite as bad as that. Um, but that point you make there about whether you should or whether it would be better to, to limit the involvement of certain owners, that can be extended to trainers. Mm. Um, Chris Cook's been on this in these these chairs before. Yeah, he's, he's a made big that, supporter. Yeah, he, doing he's that. made that argument. Maddie, would the twenty twenty three Grand National look better, be more interesting, be more competitive, more respectful for the viewing public, if trainers and I suppose in particular what you're thinking here it would apply to Willie Mons and Gordon Elliott be limited to a certain number of runners, maybe four, five, six? I think you could argue it would be more competitive and possibly more attractive from a romantic yep. storytelling perspective. Uh, but I don't think that is necessarily fair um, to the people who have the horses who are capable of running in the race. Um, but obviously there is a balance to be had there between trying to 
give everyone a good chance and almost level the playing field from this extreme dominance that we're seeing. Um, it's worth saying, I don't even think an Irish horse is going to win the race. Um, Pirate Rambler? Yeah, <laughs> yes. Uh, hit the nail on the head. But um, it's clear to see from their entries and the strength and depth that they've got, they will have a better chance. There'll be a, a much shorter price to, to have the winner in Ireland. Um, yeah, I mean, these are things that we can we can always talk about and it, it's good to try and figure out a way to address um, this balance. But as Jonathan said, I think, it, you know, we've seen the evidence of this for a while now and um, we just need to wait and see and I guess try and invest uh, more strongly in, in the British grassroots and, and make sure those channels of horses are, are coming through and, and being put our way. But when the prize money is stronger in Ireland, when you've got these superpower owners as well as trainers um, who are keen to give all their energy and money to uh, the Irish trainers, um, then things aren't going to change for a little bit at least. What about one other potential radical change to um, the Grand National? Something I've, I've written about in, in columns in the past. The Grand National as a handicap is different to all other big handicaps in that there is no penalties apply. So the the the, the weights that what well, the ratings that horses are on now will be the ratings they would run off in the Grand National. The weights will change accordingly. Obviously, if top weights come out, um, would the Grand National be a more interesting race if? You knew, for example, that the winner of the Ultima at Cheltenham might get a penalty that would take him into the Grand National field if he wasn't already in there. You can argue on the one hand, it might stop people running in those races. They felt a penalty would rise, increase their weights, but equally it might encourage people to run horses who weren't already in the field. Good thing or bad thing? I think you've touched on there the it's one that would be the proof would be in the pudding with those sort of unintended consequences, whether there was a knock-on effect of people therefore not running or being horses being moved from other races and so is it worth making the pudding then i think it's worth having a look at i think anything's worth having a look at but i my my gut reaction as you were saying it was i wouldn't like to see the the this it is a race that is broadly accessible to a lot of people i wouldn't like to see the terms of entry and all those things over complicated any further than yeah. they already are because that you know you, we have this sort of annual pantomime even in the absence of tiger roll with oh he's been allocated this way and it's done differently and this is how mm -hmm. I, do, I don't know I, I i like usually i are on the side of keeping things simple but again i think it's worth having a look at i've wonderfully sat on the fence there for you <laughs> i think another thing that's worth mentioning is those will be looking to try and pick this year's winner we have had a couple of shocks in recent years you know tiger roll was an exceptional horse who made this race his own probably the best horse or well, definitely the best horse over these fences since red rum but we've had some great horses be placed in the race and some big prices as well so if there is still room for that romantic story um let's just wait a few more years perhaps and see how the balance uh, swings after a couple more uh, goes around the national fences uh okay finally you've told us who wins the grand national i think noble yates will win the the Gold Cup and then the Grand National. You think I'll win the Grand National again? Yeah, I do. I know. Nineteen pounds higher. Yeah, I know. Crazy, aren't I? Um, Jonathan. Well, I did do. I, I was worried you'd ask me this, yeah. and I did a little bit of research. Did you? Nice. Yeah, impressive. And I actually came down, and not for the first time, with with David Jennings on. Ain't that a shame? He obviously right. ran well in the Paddy Power Chase, and looks to be one that I think the weight is absolutely vital, and he looks to be have been given a fair crack at it. So that would be my. Uh, long-range tip and one of those horses will undoubtedly win uh, the great race just one little um, schooling point before uh, we finish um, we reference the numbers that horses are uh, set to be in at the minute in the, in the order of entry um, one thing to stress is that those horses who are around the cutoff point when declarations are made on the Thursday before the Grand National their participation in the race, they're on the same weight, say horses number 38, 39, 40, 41, 42 are on the same weight. The handicap of Martin Greenwood would look at what they've achieved since the weights were allocated. And if a horse is deemed to have improved his or her rating since then, that horse then would move above those that hadn't. So although our power is currently 62 in the order of entry, in reality, he's probably 58 because of his Kempton performance on Saturday. I thank you. We now move to the second story this week. We referenced affordability checks um, last week, the biggest show 
in town in many ways horse racing and we're going to do it again but this time in conjunction with the prime minister because rishi sunak spoke at the godolphin thoroughbred industry employee awards in york on monday he surprised those in the room a video message came out from the prime minister in which he spoke about british racing at a crucial time for the industry he said and i quote here he referenced the importance of the the industry he said it's one that uh, generates over four billion pounds for our economy and showcases britain on the global stage and he added i want to see british racing and breeding stay at the front of this global race in the years ahead now that's interesting because of course to an extent that will be dependent on what the government proposes in his imminent gambling white paper. We have a new culture secretary, Lucy Fraser, and new gambling minister, Stuart Andrew. We haven't yet had the white paper, but hope for the people framing the, the white paper will have looked at the results of the Racing Post Big Punting Survey, which came out last week. It had a host of interesting statistics, including the fact that 16.6% of the 10,400 people who responded to the survey said that they had already been asked to carry out affordability checks by bookmakers and around 55% of those people claimed that or said that they had rejected that bookmaker proposal. We heard that 24% of punters had decreased their uh, amount of betting on racing in the last six months and around 15% so that they themselves are already using the black market for betting or they knew of somebody else who was. So important stats there that hopefully the government will consider in the framing of the gambling white paper. And one other point I wanted to make in reference to the Prime Minister is that although it's key for racing to be talking to government more than ever at the moment, Bill Barber, our industry editor, had a column in the paper last week where he highlighted the importance also now of talking intensely with the Labour Party. Anyone who follows politics, British politics, and looks at the polls will know that he's odds on, and probably long odds on, that there'll be a Labour majority at the next election, which has to come by the start of 2025 at the earliest. And therefore, Labour will be the party framing policy in the future. A lot to get through there, Jonathan. Uh, do you want to start on Rishi Sunak or the survey? Oh, I think I'll start with Rishi Sunak. Okay. and. I mean, ultimately, it's an incredibly encouraging message. And you were saying there about the future of the racing industry to an extent hinging on affordability checks. I don't think that can be overstated, the, the impact. You were talking about hundreds of millions of pounds knock on effect on British racing already. Um, and that if we were to extrapolate that, if the affordability checks are brought in in their most stringent form, it would be, you know, whether it would be a fatal blow we're, 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 that, we're sort of talking in those terms, potentially. So very encouraging to have the ear of the, the Prime Minister. And do you think that that video message, that intervention was linked to that? Are we, are, are we being optimistic in thinking the two things are linked? I like to think so. Yeah. Whether it is, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I'm naturally quite sceptical of these things. Whether yeah. I, I'm not sure how intimately Rishi Sunak will understand the situation with the white paper and with affordability checks and all the rest of it, but we live in hope. And it, it, if it's a coincidence, it's a, it's a fortunate one because um, the fact that he's engaging with the industry is interested in its future enough to say it publicly like that. I mean, that's not many sports have that sort of, yeah. not many sports have that personal relationship to a prime minister. So it's yeah. very good work Absolutely. lobbying from British racing, I think, to get to that point. Yeah. And he named um, some of his constituents as well who yeah. were nominated for the awards. And I, I agree with Jonathan that it's it's great to see that support. We know that the Cheltenham Festival is going to be crunch time for these affordability checks when many punters yeah. log on for the first time in a while and are wanting to have um, more frequent bets, um, bigger sums of money uh, betted on these races. We know that from um, our previous statistics that they're some of the most popular races of the whole year. But equally, I think to turn this away from the doom and gloom it is incredibly important that racing has that support from the prime minister um hopefully as jonathan said that's reflected uh, with the upcoming white paper i'm not necessarily sure that i can say with a great deal of confidence that it will be um but also as well we've got racing on terrestrial television coming up at cheltenham which i think is is huge that a lot of sports don't have um so it's not all doom and gloom we do have 
um, several things to be positive about and um, you can just hope that in the coming months we're going to see some clarity provided to the situation but we've, we've been waiting a while and we're still waiting. Uh, and I suppose interesting as well that the, the Racing Post survey of punters produced broadly similar results to a similar Racing TV survey mm -hmm. of punters which you would think gives added credence to the numbers that came out? It certainly does and the, the, it we keep coming back to the white paper and what's in the white paper and there is the, the feeling is that it's going to be less, arguably less damaging than what is already being done. And my personal worry would be that a lot of this is going to be the government's running out of legislative roads. A lot of it, I fear, and from conversations is going to be devolved to the Gambling Commission, which is slightly... Uh, taken it upon itself to, well, it, it would argue not introduce or force mm -hmm. affordability checks, but sort of created a de facto regulatory environment where they have been brought in. So I think that's going to be key. I want to see the white paper almost sanctify responsible gambling as a legal pastime, because at the moment it's being thrown in and conflated with problem gambling yeah. and everybody being at risk when actually the majority of people gamble responsibly and are being subjected to intrusive checks. Everybody in the gambling industry, racing industry in the country wants problem gamblers to be protected, they want bookmakers to do more. They can always do more to protect those people, but hopefully the white paper sort of sanctifies this idea that it is a legal and legitimate pastime to bet within your means. And hopefully that is what comes from, out of it all. From your research, which I know you've been doing a lot of, do you think this white paper will put that end to it? It's difficult to say. I mean, I, I hope so. But at the moment, it's a bit of a Wild West situation. And Lee will know as well, it's a bit of a Wild West situation where everybody's slightly guessing and trying to get steers on. And the Gambling Commission is getting a steer from somewhere. It's getting pressure from somewhere and trying to... It needs to be legislative. It needs to be clear lines in the sand of this is what we expect operators to do. This is what we expect the Gambling Commission to hold operators to account on. Whether we'll have that level of detail, I'm not entirely sure. Traditionally, um, then Jonathan and Maddie, racing has had closer relationships with the uh, Conservative Party, mainly because, um, or partly because, horse racing tends to be a rural sport and Conservative MPs tend to have rural constituencies compared to, to the Labour Party. But Labour in the past has had great links with, with horse racing. Loads of prominent Labour politicians have been big fans of the sport. I would not be concerned for horse racing uh, if and when we have a Labour government. Would either of you two be concerned, yes or no? Uh, not particularly, but any change, I guess, um, is, is going to trigger um, a different reaction. But I'm, I'm with Jonathan, um, we were speaking before, I, I don't think it should make a difference um, in terms of who's in power. No, I, I'd agree. If, if the sport should really just be putting itself on a firm footing, know what it's about, know the case that it wants to take to the wider public, let alone politicians, but also just be proactive in that lobbying. And I think, you know, once the white paper's out of the way, you'd hope there wouldn't need to be loads of lobbying, but you do need to maintain those relationships. But I, I, I don't think in, if the sport is sh sure of itself, then I don't think who's in the corridors of power should have as much bearing. And that phrase, once the white paper is out of the way, when will that actually come uh, to fruition? Um, part three then now of this week's programme. And um, the whip was an issue last week. Inevitably, Jonathan Harding, the whip is an issue this week. Yes, and it probably will be next week as well. So this was uh, last Wednesday, the BHA's whip review committee released its findings for the first week. Yeah. Uh, the first proper week under the new rules after the betting in period for jump jockeys. Um, there were 19 jockeys given suspensions, so obviously that's a larger number than people would have hoped. Arguably we expected because there was going to be a little bit of a few teething issues. I don't think anyone expected there to be quite so many though. Um, of those, there was an 18 day ban for Lorcan Williams for a winning ride at Haydock. He's now going to miss the Cheltenham Festival. Um, and the other was an unfortunate piece of history for conditional jockey Charlotte Jones, who was uh, aboard an, a runner-up at air called Lunar Discovery. In a bumper. In a bumper. She was found to have used the whip 11 times, therefore she is the first disqualification under the new rules. The BHA, actually, quite interestingly, doubled down. I think the BHA has been a little bit 
almost tentative with its rules of we'll, we'll consider it and then we'll just slightly tweak them. But actually it said, hopefully that disqualification sends a strong message to the weighing room. You'd hope that would be a deterrent with the disqualification. I mean, connections were fairly philosophical about it. And I thought to their credit, disappointed, obviously, but these are the rules. I think it's just a continuation of similar themes. And, and the big thing for me throughout this entire process has been the timing. Now it's too late because they've been brought in and we can't say, well, they should have been brought in in the summer because we are where we are. But I am worried going into this week that we're going to have bands that are going to rule big jockeys or any jockey out of the Cheltenham Festival. And, and that to me is a as I say, as a PR exercise, I think is unfair, but for a, a, an initiative that is very focused on optics, no doubt very well intentioned. I don't think it's a wonderful look to have 19 jockeys given suspensions, goodness knows how many this week, how many high profile names talk about potentially a couple of disqualifications it's again. Are two more DQ, yeah. potentially. Not a good look, but as far as the BHA is concerned, you know, that they've said these are the rules, they'll, they'll hope that will be a deterrent. There's no greater deterrent than you might miss the Cheltenham Festival or God forbid be disqualified. So fingers crossed, but there's a lot a lot more teething that needs to be done here before they're, they're properly sort of bedded in with jockeys. And it's, it's, not a, it's not a good look. There's a lot of talk as well, isn't there, about jockeys missing the Cheltenham Festival. We know Lorcan Williams is going mm -hmm. to, but also I'm concerned given we've had this quantity um, of offences in just the first week or so, at the Cheltenham Festival itself, when the stakes are at their highest, how many bands are we going to see, um, you know, headlining the meeting rather than the racing itself? So I think that's a, a real concern on people's mm. minds. We've had Paul Nichols reportedly saying to Harry Cobden, you know, be careful this week. We don't want you be banned, to be banned for Cheltenham. But also getting banned at Cheltenham or even possible disqualification as well has got to be a, a real concern. Yeah, I mean, I, I was one of those who um, agreed with people like Sir Mark Prescott that um, jockeys wouldn't really get disqualified because they would know that if they went X above the, the limit that they would lose a race. But we have had one disqualification already. As I say, mm. there's suggestions at last week's Devon National and the bumper at Newcastle um, on... It's hard to know, isn't it, now with this so, new system? Yeah, yeah. But there's just about, there might be more DQs. Um, has that in itself surprised you that, that already one jockey has been DQ'd and at least two others have certainly come close to the, the DQ threshold? Um, I, think it has, I think it has surprised me a little bit. All I would say is to put the shoe on the other foot is that the BHA, you know, have put these rules in place, yes, there's been a, an extended period of uh, conversation, perhaps a lack of quality communication between the different groups involved. Um, Sometimes within the groups as well. Yeah, yeah. and they've, they've made these rules and hey, at least they're sticking by them. And I yeah. guess if there is disqualifications, if there are uh, breaking of the rules, at least that shows that in their minds, they were right to take this action. Um, but clearly, uh, they've already taken a step back and looked at how this is going to be implemented with um, the shoulder height rule, for instance, um, and how difficult that's been for jockeys to adapt to. Um, so it's hard to know, really. I think the next week we will know more. Um, but as I say, I am concerned with those spring, big spring festivals on the horizon, um, how much this is going to dominate racing's uh, discourse. Yeah, and I think the rules have been brought into combat what we might call a sort of win at all costs mm -hmm. mentality, a case of get the race won yeah. and then worry about your ban afterwards, where disqualification obviously takes that out of the equation. But Cheltenham Festival is a win at all costs meeting for a lot of people. That's where you need to be getting results. And I mean, it would be really unsatisfactory to have a Gold Cup winner disqualified a week later because of a whip back, going over the whip. Yeah, I've got to say that that's one where I, I may be, um, I'm not with the consensus view. The consensus view seemed to be that it was better not to disqualify horses on the day for whip offences because it would leave punters of the winning horse irate. I would take the view 
if you're a punter of the horse who finishes second in that race, but then gets promoted, I would be pretty all right if I was beaten by a jockey who had broken the rules. And my big fear, I suppose, for the DQ question, the festival, is that we see a jockey ride a winner at the Cheltenham Festival, and it is blatantly obvious at the time that he or she has broken the whip rules, and yet we still have to go through what would be a farce of the winning connections going to the podium to collect prizes, which we knew that a few days later would be taken off them. It has the potential to be a real mess, doesn't it? Let's not mince our words here. Um, and we can only hope that the communication between parties is strong, that as we're hearing from jockeys, they're going to do their best to adapt and the BHA are going to show um, discretion when they're looking at these offences. Um, but there is no discretion, is there? Not with the number of strikes. There's not, but in terms of shoulder height, I okay, think yeah. many can accept that the messages that they were getting throughout the bedding in period um, about how many days they would have been banned for, that has relented yeah. a little bit since they were actually implemented, which is, from what I can tell, one of the main issues that jockeys were having. Um, so I guess we're now handing over to the participants. We're relying on them um, to move forward with this uh, and, and show racing in its best light, but the stakes don't get any higher. No, and just to end this one, in terms of participants, I was at say, Kempton on Saturday and one participant in particular really impressed me. Sam Twiston Davis won the Coral Trophy on our power again, 150 grand race, so it mattered. His horse was struggling all the way down the far side, but he, he pushed and he shoved and he kept the horse in contention. And then he used the, the whip maybe three, four times at most at the home straight. And he said afterwards, um, for me, it's very much about trying to get into contention by pushing and kicking because I then know I've got seven reminders up my sleeve. He went on to add the rules are there. We all work together, we talk to each other and we can hopefully keep going forward for the love of the sport. I think that's a really positive message as well. Absolutely, Lee. And I think a note to end on looking at this in a more positive light is to say in the long term, we're hopeful that this can create uh, a better looking sport, which hopefully um, enables jockeys to ride better races. Yeah, absolutely right. And of course, we should also stress as well, it's not just a British thing, this. Not all jurisdictions are the same. But I know having been at the uh, Asian Racing Conference that the whip is an issue that unites many jurisdictions at the moment. Okay, that then is the end of our three discussions. Time for me to decide who has the winning story this week. And I'll start by saying I've not given it to myself for a for an awfully you haven't. No, uh, you've been a, good. For an awfully long time. Bear that in mind when I say, Maddie, I think the Grand National is obviously the, the world's greatest horse race. There's always a, 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 a set of issues and themes when, when the if weights the come out. If the top weight connections weren't happy with having top weight, it wouldn't be the Grand National, would it? No, exactly. Good point. And Jonathan, um, a skier, um, really good, strong stuff on the on, on the whip there. And certainly week one yielded perhaps more in terms of uh, material and stories than we necessarily hoped it would. Uh, and we'll see what comes up in week two. But I would just say this week, the Prime Minister is the Prime Minister. And at the time when racing um, is uh, facing a serious, uh, serious potentially potential battle, so it's serious conversations with, uh, with government and the Gambling Commission, Rishi Sunet's very positive comments about horse racing and his desire that racing flourishes in the future financially, I thought was extremely interesting. And for that reason, and with apologies, um, I'm giving myself the winning story. Congratulations, Lee. <laughs> I'm a terrible person. That then was this week's edition of The Front Page. Thank you to Jonathan. Thanks to Maddie. We're back next week. And um, bear in mind, next Monday will be eight days out from the start of a quite important four-day race meeting in the Cotswolds. I suspect the Chartland Festival could be one of the discussion topics then. Until then, bye-bye.